high quality, wholesome milk. From dedicated, passionate U.S. dairy farmers is the foundation for outstanding dairy products. Every day of the year, U.S. milk is transformed into millions of metric tons of high quality cheese, whey proteins, lactose, milk powder, and many other dairy products. Want more choices? With hundreds of suppliers, global customers enjoy diverse options to fulfill varying tastes, mineral contents, functional properties, and more. To meet global demand, the U.S. dairy industry is continually expanding its product and ingredient portfolio. Multi-layer protection steps support consistent delivery of wholesome dairy products. From farms in the USA to tables throughout the world, this dynamic network of suppliers is embracing international markets. To discover how you can deliver a world-class portfolio of cheese and dairy ingredients, think USA Dairy. Eu gostaria de oficialmente dar as boas-vindas a todos ao webinar Nutrição e Funcionalidade das Proteínas Lácteas dos Estados Unidos. O que você precisa saber sobre as proteínas lácteas e vegetais? Esse webinar, gente, está sendo oferecido pelo USDEC, que é o Conselho de Exportadores de Lácteos dos Estados Unidos. Tá? É, meu nome é Carolina Nascimento e eu sou sócia da empresa de consultoria River Global. E a River Global representa o USDEC aqui na América do Sul. Gente, para quem não conhece o trabalho do USDEC ou nunca esteve conosco em outros eventos, é, o USDEC ele tem um trabalho estritamente institucional. Tá? Então, ele representa 80% da indústria de processamento de leite dos Estados Unidos, mas a gente se dedica especialmente a educar toda a indústria, toda a cadeia né, de distribuição, né, de processamento de alimentos e também, enfim, de produtos que usem é, os produtos provenientes do leite de vaca dos Estados Unidos, tá? Então, a gente trabalha de mãos dadas, tanto com universidades, pesquisadores, quanto importadores, distribuidores, fabricantes, processadores e indústrias alimentícias, tá? Então, esse webinar aqui é, é parte do nosso trabalho de educação e de fornecer a vocês informação de primeira mão para que usem de melhor maneira, claro, os ingredientes e os, as proteínas né, que a gente vai discutir hoje do leite dos Estados Unidos, tá? Bom, é, como eu comentei, é um prazer para a gente mais uma vez estar aqui com vocês, a gente está tendo já uma boa audiência nessa manhã fria, eu estou aqui em São Paulo e acredito que a gente tem bastante gente aqui conectada já do Brasil. É, e aí, então, gente, agora é, eu gostaria de só contar para vocês um pouquinho de como vai ser é, o nosso... A primeira informação é que o evento hoje vai ser um pouquinho mais longo do que os outros que a gente é, já organizou. Então, se preparem para quase duas horas de evento, a gente vai ter aproximadamente uma hora e vinte de apresentações e depois, como sempre, uma sessão muito interativa de perguntas e respostas, tá? Então, fiquem à vontade para mandar suas perguntas, seus comentários, tanto pela funcionalidade de perguntas e respostas aqui, quanto pelo é, chat do evento, tá bom? É, bom, vamos proceder então agora, é, pessoal, com as boas-vindas aos nossos queridos é, convidados e palestrantes, nossos experts no tema, tá? É, eu gostaria de, primeiramente, dar as boas-vindas à minha colega do USDEC, a Terry Rexford. E a Terry, gente, ela é vice-presidente de marketing global de ingredientes, tá? Então, vamos lá. Bom dia, Terry. Good morning, Carolina. Thanks for joining everyone. We hope you enjoy our webinar today. Muito obrigada, Terry. A gente também tem é, um convidado especial. É, a gente tem aqui conosco o Matthew Pikoski. E o Matthew, ele é vice-presidente de pesquisa em nutrição no National Dairy Council. Bom dia, Matt. Bem-vindo. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Really looking forward to engaging with you today. Perfeito. 
E a nossa terceira e ilustre convidada é a Mary Wilcox, e ela é consultora e fundadora da empresa Significant Outcomes. Bem-vinda, Mary. It's a great honor to be here today, and I look forward to hearing from you in the chat and Q&A. Thank you. Muito obrigada. Bom, pessoal, como vocês também já estão acostumados, se vocês estiveram com a gente em outros eventos, a gente sempre gosta de fazer algumas perguntas para, claro que para engajar vocês né, no tema e já aclimatar todo mundo na discussão, mas também para conhecer um pouquinho assim, dos interesses de vocês e como que a gente pode também trabalhar futuramente com os nossos eventos e desenvolvimento de mercado, tá? Então, eu vou colocar... Aqui na tela, duas perguntas desses pools do Zoom, tá? Para vocês responderem. A primeira é... Vamos lá, vou lançar para vocês. Um, você ou a sua empresa tem interesse em proteínas lácteas, vegetais ou em ambas? Vou dar alguns segundinhos para vocês responderem. Está bem interessante a participação. Mais um pouquinho. Só comentando aqui, bom, claro que todo mundo da indústria sabe, mas proteínas lácteas a gente sempre menciona o WPC, o WPI, o MPC, o MPI, proteínas no geral. Tá? Bom, as vegetais são muitas e a gente sabe que também tem a grande combinação. Perfeito. Bastante engajamento. Esse daqui, eu vou mostrar para vocês, para vocês saberem aqui exatamente quais são os interesses. É, bom, a gente tem a ampla maioria interessada em ambas proteínas, tá? Então, a gente teve aqui 61% dos nossos participantes é, interessados em ambas. Muito interessante. Maravilha. Então, essa aqui foi a primeira pergunta, gente. Aí eu tenho uma segunda pergunta que eu vou lançar agora. Vamos lá que é, na verdade, sobre as categorias de interesse, tá? Então, quais as categorias vocês acreditam que tem o maior potencial de desenvolvimento em alimentos e bebidas com proteínas aqui no Brasil? Então, a gente tem aqui algumas opções que a gente pensou. A gente pensou em panificação, em barras nutricionais, em confeitaria, produtos lácteos, a gente pensou em bebidas também, snacks, uh, molhos. É, a gente... Não colocou especificamente nutrição esportiva aqui, porque a gente está pensando aqui em indústria alimentícia, né? processamento de alimentos como um todo, tá? Mais um pouquinho para vocês poderem participar. Nossa, bem dividida, bem interessante mesmo. Perfeito. Vou finalizar aqui. Muito obrigada pela participação de vocês. E vou aproveitar para mostrar os resultados. É, a gente teve um grande vencedor aqui. É, produtos lácteos disparado aqui com 75%, tá? E eu também queria destacar aqui bebidas e snacks, pessoal. E claro, barras nutricionais. Muito obrigada pela participação. Eu estou tirando aqui os resultados da tela. E aí, então, o que, de novo, eu gostaria de falar para vocês é a gente vai ter agora, então, aproximadamente uma hora e vinte de apresentação dos nossos três convidados, tá? Muito interessante, presta atenção no conteúdo, mandem suas perguntas para a gente pelo Q&A ou pelo chat, e fiquem conosco até o final, porque a sessão de perguntas e respostas promete bastante para esse evento, tá bom? É, de novo, muito obrigada por estarem conosco, e não esqueçam de optar pela funcionalidade de interpretação disponível na barra inferior do Zoom, tá bom, pessoal? Bom, vamos começar então com as apresentações, e até já! Hi, everyone. Welcome to our listeners, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Terry Rexrode, and I work in global marketing for the U.S. Dairy Export Council. We are pleased to offer today's webinar, U.S. Dairy Protein Nutrition and Functionality, 
what you need to know about dairy and plant-based proteins. During the webinar, please enter your questions in the box available on your screen. And at the end, we will host a Q&A session. We will answer as many questions as possible, time permitting, and all unanswered questions will be addressed by email after the webinar. First, a little about US DAC for those of you that may not be familiar with us. We are a nonprofit membership organization working on behalf of US dairy farmers. Since US DAC was founded in 1995, US dairy exports have increased by more than sevenfold to over $6.6 .6 billion annually. In 2020, the US dairy industry exported a record volume of 2.1 million metric tons which is the equivalent of 16% of US milk solids. We have offices located in export markets around the world, across Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America. Our global team is focused on building demand for US dairy ingredients and cheese. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First is Matthew Pekoski, Vice President of Nutrition Research for the National Dairy Council. In this role, Matt leads the Dairy Protein Nutrition Research Program to build scientific evidence supporting the benefits of milk and dairy protein ingredients. Today, Matt will review the nutrient profiles of dairy and plant proteins, and he'll explain how dairy proteins provide unmatched nutrition benefits across all life stages. Our second speaker, Mary Wilcox, is the founder of consulting company, Significant Outcomes LLC. And she has over 25 years of experience in product development and business development for food and agriculture. In today's presentation, Mary will help navigate the protein landscape by comparing the functional properties of dairy and plant proteins. These properties are critical in the successful formulation of foods and beverages. Welcome Matt and Mary. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Pekoski. I'm the Vice President of Nutrition Research with the National Dairy Council based in the US. Thanks for joining me today for my presentation titled Advantages of Dairy Proteins versus Plant Proteins with a focus on nutrition. Now protein is an essential nutrient required by our body every day. And amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein provide structural components needed for a number of critical body functions. While most people are familiar with the link or association between amino acids, dietary protein, and having uh, muscle building or muscle support, there's actually a number of essential body functions that require dietary protein and then the essential amino acids from that protein. And that, you know, as noted in that first bullet, not only strong muscle, but also the skeletal system. So, you know, adequate protein is important to support bone health. Uh, we need protein to uh, transport oxygen to our muscles. That's the body protein hemoglobin. Uh, metabolize other nutrients that help with digestion and obviously getting the nutrients to our body and organs and tissues that need that. That's enzymes, which is a protein. And then healthy immune functions, certainly important in today's environment of the pandemic that we're still working through. And that, that's uh, the function of immune proteins. Now, next layer of detail when you're thinking about amino acids, there are two core categories of amino acids. There is the essential or indispensable amino acids. Those amino acids are not able to be made by the body, therefore they must be supplied by the diet. And then there's the other amino acids that are called the dispensable or the non-essential amino acids. And again, those can be made by the body and don't necessarily need to be provided by the diet, although they are. So again, a focus really from diets and looking at, you know, whether it's the total diet or individual foods, we want to look at a food's ability to provide those essential amino acids, those nine essentials, which cannot be made by the body, they must be supplied by the diet. And we know that the essential amino acids, and in particular, the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And then I would say over the last 10 to 15 years or so, there has been a growing body of literature and emphasis on leucine in particular as probably the most important of the essential amino acids when we're looking at stimulating and supporting 
muscle protein synthesis. And, and lastly, you know, in a big picture, insufficient of intake of essential amino acids is gonna compromise the ability of tissue to grow, be repaired, or be maintained. And that's gonna have ultimately a cascade of negative effects on our overall health. Now, when it comes to comparing different proteins, hopefully many of you have heard of the topic or term protein quality. And in, in a general sense, this helps to indicate the fact that not all proteins are created equal when it comes to the nutrition that they provide. Protein quality can be defined as the ability of a food protein to meet the body's metabolic demand for amino acids and nitrogen. And that metabolic demand um, you know, goes back to the slide, the, the topics that I mentioned on that first slide, right? Supporting musculoskeletal health, transport of oxygen to tissues, digestion of the food we eat through enzymes, et cetera. Now, food proteins vary in their protein quality based on three key factors. Amino acid composition with higher quality proteins having the full array of essential amino acids in sufficient amounts required by the body. Also the digestibility of that protein and then the bioavailability of the digested amino acids from that protein. Now, generally speaking, animal proteins are more digestible than plant proteins. And, and that's due to a few different factors. And, and primarily it's due to the other components um, that are found that's coming along with those proteins from that food source or ingredient source, right? And, and in particular, plant proteins in general in comparison to animal proteins have more what is called anti-nutritional factors that do inhibit either the digestion and or bioavailability of the protein and amino acids in that particular food source. Now, when it comes to protein quality scoring, there are a number of different methods available, but there's two that I'm highlighting on this slide. The first, the PDCAS or the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, that's really considered, you know, has been around for a long time and is still considered the gold standard for assessing protein quality. It's recognized by the FDA in the United States and also is recognized internationally by groups such as the FAO. In addition, we have a more recent method called the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. So that's a new model of protein quality assessment that was recommended a few years ago by an expert panel convened by the FAO to independently review current quality assessments and make recommendations as to if a new methodology should be utilized. And again, their, their conclusion was that this new DIAS method will be more accurate and you'll be seeing it if you haven't already in the literature more and more. The table on your left here to end um, this slide is, is comparing both PDCAS and DIAS scores of a number of different ingredients, which you can see above the red line, and then whole foods, which you can see below the red line. And what's shown, whether it's an ingredient or whole food, and or whether it's with PDCAS or DIAS, is that dairy proteins are the highest quality proteins available. Again, whether it comes from ingredient or whole food source. Now, when it comes to you know, the, the, the real world application of this protein quality and the health and or physiologic endpoints that we could assess in terms of how protein quality is impacting our health, you know, the primary way this is looked at scientifically is its ability to promote muscle gain and or maintain muscle. And you know, while some folks may think you know, muscle is only important um, in the sports and exercise space, young active adults, athletes, and or adults who have a concern in regarding to their aesthetic appearance and the value that muscle plays there. But actually that's an extremely you know, small and closed-minded view in my opinion. And I think in, in most scientists opinion that are experts in this area. And that's because skeletal muscle, the quantity and quality of that muscle play a key role in a number of ways to influence our health. You could see, you know, plays role in strength and mobility. And of course that's important in sport, but that's also important to support healthy aging. Think about, you know, being in your middle age and older years and needing to carry groceries up a flight of stairs or, you know, do activities with your children and grandchildren and 
uh, things of that nature. You know, the, the quality and quantity of your muscle is going to be important to allow you to continue to do those well into your older years. Muscle contributes to resting energy expenditure. It's metabolically active tissue in comparison to fat, which is not. So it contributes to calorie burning. So certainly muscle has a role in connection with weight management. It's also one of the primary sites of glucose disposal. So as such, muscle plays a role in metabolic regulation and has a role in terms of supporting metabolic health. So you can see here with the greater quantity and quality of muscle that one possesses, you'll see a decreased risk for not only metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Now, when it comes to the, the different physiologic processes going on in our body to kind of regulate or manage our ability to either gain, lose, or maintain muscle. We're looking at that balance between rates of muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. And when rates of synthesis will exceed breakdown, you're gonna have muscle growth. And when the opposite is true, you're gonna have muscle loss. And this slide shows that there are a number of different uh, factors that may impact uh, this balance between synthesis and breakdown, but the primary one uh, that we have under our control in addition to exercise, and the one in which I'm gonna focus on for my talk today is nutrition, and then more specifically, protein nutrition. Now, when it comes to protein recommendations, I think it's really important to clarify some of the confusion or what I think is a misinterpretation of those recommendations. So in the US and globally, as well as in, in individual countries, um, you know, we have you know, what in the US we deem the recommended dietary allowance or the RDA. Uh, and that's set at 0.8 grams per kilo body weight per day for adults. And you know, often I will see whether it's from health professionals or whether it's the you know, press trying to laymanize scientific information for consumers is that they will look at this level as kind of the goal um, or ceiling with which protein intake should not exceed. And they talk about anything in excess of the RDA as excessive and potentially harmful of, for health. And that is just um, not accurate. The RDA in this quote is actually from the document that outlines the RDA is really that estimate of the minimum daily average dietary intake level that meets the requirements of nearly all healthy individuals. So again, the RDA should be viewed as a minimum amount to prevent deficiency. It is not an optimal amount to support health or it is not a ceiling by which we should not exceed. We also have the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. So this provides, you know, again, a, a range of protein intakes uh, that can be consumed safely, okay? And as you can see the definition here, a range of intakes for a particular energy source that's associated with reduced risk of chronic disease while providing adequate intakes of essential nutrients. So that's 10 to 35% of total calories when it comes to protein. So to put that numbers into perspective, let's look at for a 70 kilogram male consuming 2000 calories a day. The RDA for that person would be 56 grams of protein per day. But what you can see with the AMDR is that it gives a much broader range or flexibility from which individuals can personalize their protein intake depending on their health and nutritional goals. Now there's a large and growing body of research that supports that some population groups may benefit from intakes greater than the RDA. And as you can see here, there's research around athletes and highly active adults, older adults, and those interested in weight management. Uh, and when we're talking about higher protein intakes, I'm talking at, you know, the middle to upper end of that AMDR range. Now, as we don't have the time to go through the full body of literature um, in today's webinar, I'd like to highlight some conclusions from recent position stands and or papers from expert panels to kind of give us a nice grounding of what's recommended in the scientific literature today. Now here's a position stand from three prominent uh, nutrition and fitness organizations based in North America. And you can see that their total protein intake recommended for athletes and active adults is around 1.2 to two grams of protein per kilo body weight per day. So again, notably higher than the current RDA. 
They also provide recommendations for suggested meal intakes because we know not only the total amount of protein, but how that protein is distributed or consumed over the cross course of the day is important. So they recommend 20 to 30 grams and specifically call out high quality protein after workouts and at main meals. And one measure they use to indicate high quality protein is that they want that protein or that meal, that individual food to deliver about 10 grams of essential amino acids. And that's what they're using as that indication of quality. And that's because research that's been done and primarily done with various high quality proteins has shown that you know, the amount of protein consumed from those foods provides about 10 grams of amino acids, essential amino acids, and that maximizes the muscle protein synthesis response, which we remember is one of the key drivers for maintaining or increasing muscle. Similarly, when it comes to older adults, and here is indicated by those aged 65 and older, that expert groups have recommended higher protein intakes in comparison to the RDA. You can see the range here. A minimum protein intake for healthy adults has been recommended at about one to 1.2 grams of protein per kilo body weight per day. And that could go up to about two grams of protein per kilo body weight per day for those older adults who are dealing with severe illness or injury or marked malnutrition. Now, again, in addition to total protein intake, you can see to the right of this figure that there's additional recommendations for a certain amount of protein per meal, but also a certain amount of leucine per meal, which is, again, an indication or a proxy for the quality of that protein uh, and the importance of leucine with muscle metabolism and needing a certain amount of leucine, again, to be a proxy for protein metabolism, protein quality, and maximizing the muscle protein synthesis response. Now, in the literature, it's, it's recognized that dairy proteins are some of the highest quality proteins and they're recognized for their value and efficacy in supporting muscle health. And these quotes that are taken from two different position stands uh, from these expert uh, health professional organizations, which I have noted here, um, are specific to the sports and exercise space as to that's where the largest body of literature to date um, has been published. And you can see from the first quote, I'll read to date, dairy proteins seem to be superior to other tested proteins, largely due to leucine content in the digestion and absorptive kinetics of the branch chain amino acids in fluid-based dairy foods. Now, the second quote from the International Society of Sport Nutrition is similar. I won't take the time to read it, but again, it's, it's calling out the quality of animal proteins and dairy proteins in particular in comparison to plant proteins. Again, because of that higher amount and concentration of essential amino acids, leucine, and then for the digestibility and bioavailability of those amino acids. Now, the next few slides, I think, provide some very um, nice and handy charts, which look at essential amino acid concentrations and then subsequently leucine concentrations as a percent of total protein within a variety of plant and animal-based sources. You see the, the table here to the right, you know, summarizes comparisons of some of these more succinctly. And what you could see is that the dairy proteins have notably higher essential amino acid concentrations uh, than the other proteins listed, and particularly in comparison to some of the popular plant proteins. So again, they're more efficient in their delivery of essential amino acids, which is gonna be important for muscle health. Similar conclusion when it comes to leucine. Again, you look at both whey and casein, the two dairy proteins, they have the highest percent leucine concentration uh, from a total protein perspective, when you compare them to all of the other proteins. And again, look at the differences um, across whey and casein in comparison to some of the more popular plant-based ones, whether it's rice, soy, lentil, et cetera. You know, it can be upwards of two times the amount uh, or percent of leucine in comparison to some of these other sources. Now, there's some discussion certainly in the, in the food and beverage community um, that 
you know, the, these differences in protein quality from individual animal proteins or dairy proteins in comparison to plant proteins can be, you know, accounted for or made up for by blending, you know, whether it's two or more plant protein ingredients together. And if by doing that, you know, there's a thought that you might be able to match in terms of quality. Well, here is a recently published study that examined that exact question. So what you could see and the number of, you know, the different blends are shown below the table here is that there are three different plant protein blends and they were compared to whey protein isolate. So the C in the table is the whey protein isolate and then numbers one through three are different plant protein blends. And what they did is that they matched for total leucine content, PDCAS score, and total essential amino acid content. And again, theoretically, they should have the same response in the body given the efforts made to match on those factors. Now, there's one thing I wanna point out here before we look at some of the results from this study is that you know, the simple fact that in order to match the leucine and essential amino acid content from the whey protein isolates, the three different blends had to provide about 10 grams more of total protein. So again, that shows the efficiency with which whey protein isolate in this example specifically is delivering those key amino acids. You know, essentially the efficiency with which it's going to um, support muscle health. Now this first figure here looks at, you know, changes in blood essential amino acids, total amino acids over the four hours in which they were measured. And you could see despite matching for essential amino acid content, and leucine content, the whey protein isolate group has a much higher, significantly higher blood levels of the essential amino acids. Here's another um, figure which just shows area under the curve. So for the total four hour period, you know, again, blood levels of essential amino acids, which are important to support the muscle response um, to protein consumption was significantly higher in comparison to all the blends. And you know, I'm not gonna show the figures, but the leucine uh, concentrations also were higher. You can see 28 to 35% higher for the whey protein uh, isolates in comparison to the three different blends. So what this is showing is that you know, there's something beyond just the amino acid composition. Again, it's gotta come down to either the digestibility and or ultimately bioavailability. Now, additional work would be needed to kind of look at you know, what's the physiologic or health impact of these differences in plasma amino acid responses. But in subsequent slides, I'm gonna show some of the work that's been done um, that again would lend you to believe that these differences in blood amino acid levels is important. So again, for you know, transitioning, I'm gonna look at some of the data that's directly compared uh, dairy versus plant proteins when it comes to muscle health. Just to orient you, you know, typically um, what's done is either measuring muscle protein synthesis, which on subsequent slides you'll see is indicated by FSR or fractional synthetic rate on the graphs, and or measuring the amount of muscle gained over time that's done with you know, protein consumption with or without exercise training. So this first study looked at whey protein in comparison to casein and then soy in a group of young adults, and it looked at it at rest and then after resistance exercise. And one thing to note here is that, you know, what the investigators did in this experiment were actually tried to match essential amino acid delivery. So they had to give a little bit more soy in comparison to whey protein to match providing 10 grams of essential amino acids. So, you know, interestingly, this is really looking at potential differences from a digestibility and bioavailability perspective when it comes to whey and soy. And what you can see is that after exercise, the whey protein group resulted in significantly higher muscle protein synthesis in comparison to the soy group. Now, when we look at, again, those blood essential amino acid levels, you can see particularly at the early time periods, 30 and 60 minutes, whey protein is in this upper line, had higher total essential amino acids in comparison to the soy and casein groups. And similarly, when it comes to leucine, again, at 30 and 60 minutes, significantly higher plasma levels of leucine from the whey group 
in comparison to the other two groups. And again, that's likely part of the mechanism that's driving the benefit when it comes to greater muscle protein synthesis. Now, the next question would be, do acute or short-term differences in muscle protein synthesis over time impact the amount of muscle gain? And here's one of the longest training studies, you know, one of the longest controlled training studies that's been done and published to date. There's a nine month resistance training program, including previously untrained college aged men and women. They supplemented daily with about 20 grams of either whey protein, soy protein, or calorie matched carbohydrate control. And they did a routine resistance exercise training again over nine months. And what you could see here on the left is that the whey protein group gained significantly more muscle, 3.3 kilograms of muscle over the nine month period in comparison to the soy group who can gained 1.8, then the carbohydrate group who gained 2.3 kilograms of muscle. So again, these acute differences in muscle protein synthesis are likely what contributed to these greater gains in muscle mass over time. Just to again, show you some of these differences in blood amino acid levels, and here looking at leucine specifically, in the 60 minutes post-exercise, either in the untrained state to the left or the trained state after nine months of training to the right. And again, the whey protein group, you see notably higher leucine in the blood in comparison to the other two supplemented groups. Now, similar positive results, whether comparing uh, whey protein or milk in comparison to soy protein ingredient or soy beverage have been demonstrated in other studies with resistance exercise. And that's been shown in both old and younger adults. Now transitioning outside of the sports and exercise realm into the weight management realm. And as I alluded to in the previous slide, you know, muscle can play an important role in weight management in terms of uh, supporting energy expenditure. And certainly from a health standpoint, it's gonna be preferential to maintain muscle during weight loss while preferentially losing body fat. And we know research has generally established that during a weight loss diet where you're eating less calories than are required for your energy needs, that um, higher protein diets will help to preserve muscle during that weight loss period. What hasn't been shown um, is, you know, is there a difference between the quality of protein provided within that scenario. So this study looked to address that question. So we had 40 overweight and obese men and women, about middle-aged, 50 years old, uh, a 14 day weight loss diet. You know, they supplemented uh, two times a day with either whey protein, soy protein, or carbohydrate. And to the right here is the figure is the results. Again, you know, at the beginning of the 14 day period, and then at the end of the 14 day weight loss period. And the three primary findings are one, whey protein exceeded soy protein when it came to muscle protein synthesis, right? Whether it was at the beginning of the trial or the end of the 14 day weight loss period, rates of muscle protein synthesis were significantly higher for whey in comparison to both soy and carbohydrate. Additionally, whey protein attenuated the decline in post-meal rates of muscle protein synthesis after weight loss compared to soy protein. And what this is gonna do over time is ultimately, this may lead to a greater preservation of muscle during long-term weight loss interventions, which again is gonna be a preferential outcome. So protein quality here examined between providing whey protein in comparison to soy does seem to impact muscle metabolism in a weight loss phase. And again, which may lead to preferential uh, changes in body composition over time. Now, the next group I want to look at is older adults. And again, that category of, of healthy aging. And we know muscle is critically important for older adults because you know as we age, we do uh, lose muscle. We also lose muscle uh, strength and function. And what that leads to is um, sarcopenia. And we know that sarcopenia has a significant uh, number of health problems that it causes, increases rates of falls and fractures, increases dependent living, also increases morbidity and mortality. So, you know, uh, this study 
looked at, you know, 20 healthy older adults and actually did a bed rest model. So this is kind of, you know, you know, a few days of bed rest, which would be similar to acute hospitalization and or if you were just, you know, you know, laid up in bed at home, um, you know, due to an illness or injury or something similar. So again, a seven day bed rest study followed by five days of rehabilitation to see if they could gain back some of the function that was lost uh, during the rest period. Diets were matched for total qual calories and macronutrient composition, but the quality of the diets were varied. Is in the whey diet, you know, there was about 10 to 15 grams of whey protein provided at each meal, and that was swapped out from some other proteins that were provided at those meals in the mixed diets. Uh, again, to improve the overall quality of the, the protein in the diet via whey protein. So here you could see the total protein provided from the mixed diet in the whey groups, both during the bed rest period and the five day rehabilitation period. And actually while they were you know, trying to match these protein intakes, the whey groups had a bit less or a bit lower total protein intake when it came to bed rest and rehabilitation. You could also see just the percent animal and plant proteins within the two diets, again, slightly more animal protein, again, because they delivered that through some additional whey protein. But overall, I would say both of these diets are generally would be looked at as, as pretty high quality. But let's see, what did you know supplementing a modest amount of whey protein at each meal do for these individuals? Well, we saw that bed rest, or these investigators saw that bed rest resulted in a decrease in muscle mass and strength in both groups. However, the whey diet was able to partially protect leg lean mass in comparison to the mixed diet. The whey group also lost more fat mass than the mixed group during bed rest. And lastly, following the five day rehabilitation period, the whey group experienced a full recovery of muscle strength while the decrement in strength persisted in the mixed group. So again, this could have significant implications, not only for medical nutrition, you know, both during and post uh, hospital discharge, but also, you know, in older adult nutrition in general, when we have periods of decreased activity, you know, being uh, cognizant of trying to include higher quality proteins in your diet can be beneficial. Now, I do want to acknowledge that there are studies that demonstrate that these differences in protein quality between dairy proteins and plant proteins or lower quality proteins can be accounted for by simply consuming a greater amount, higher amounts of lower quality protein. And this figure on the right here is trying to illustrate that concept by showing different amounts of rice protein isolate or whey protein isolate and how those different amounts across higher increasing levels would ultimately help one to get into this threshold this ideal range for a certain amount of leucine, which we have here, 1.7 to 3.5 grams of leucine. And that's, you know, once you exceed that range, you're not getting an additional benefit. So a good analogy to think of, you could think of your muscle um, as kind of a cup. And the, the protein and amino acids going into that muscle is like pouring water into a cup. And there's gonna be a point at which you, you know, are are pouring amino acids or pouring water into that cup where that cup becomes full, that water is no longer beneficial. It just overflows and is essentially goes unused. And that's how you could look at this muscle full effect or the ability of different proteins to fill that cup. And then by which providing additional protein or additional essential amino acids is no longer gonna have an effect. So with a lower quality protein, it's less efficient at filling that cup. But if you provide enough of it, that cup will eventually be filled. So here you could see supplementation with whey protein or rice protein at 48 grams per day resulted in similar improvements in body composition and exercise performance following eight weeks of resistance training in young men. Now the point here is that what we've seen, and if you recall the recommendations from the position stands for sports and exercise to maximize the muscle response to training recommended somewhere about 20 to 30 grams or about 10 grams of essential amino acid. So this greatly exceeded that, but you know, that higher level was needed from this lower quality protein in order to provide enough of those essential amino acids to get the effect. Similar 
concept here in older men, 35 grams of casein, but not wheat protein hydrolysate, increased muscle protein synthesis, but then 60 grams of wheat protein hydrolysate was needed to increase muscle protein synthesis in those older men. Lastly, you know, 70 grams of microprotein increased muscle protein synthesis to a greater extent than milk protein. However, look at the amounts. Again, 70 grams of microprotein, which provides a mix of total protein uh, and some carbohydrate uh, in comparison to, you know, less than half milk protein, 26 grams. So again, so these are not, you know, gram for gram comparisons. Um, you know, in this instance in particular, you had to provide more in order to get that effect. Now, you know, some may say, you know, what's, what's the problem with providing a bit more? Just eat a bit more plant protein, you'll get similar benefits. Well, you know, I think that is a, a particular thing to consider and may not be the most prudent recommendation. When you think about, you know, the extremely high rates of overweight and obesity throughout, you know, throughout the world that we're faced with today, right? Um, simply recommending to the general population, you know, just eat more plant protein to get those benefits that are derived from dairy proteins, um, you know, is, is, not, is not prudent when, you know, with eating more protein, you're gonna bring more calories um, and which could be contributing to weight gain. Here you could see uh, from a review paper from Dr. Bob Wolf, looking at the uh, kilocalories you know, per gram of protein for a number of different plant and animal sources, right? And what you can see again, whey protein specifically is most efficient. And then you know, animal proteins are gonna be more efficient than plant proteins uh, when it comes to delivering essential amino acids in comparison to the amount of calories. And I'll read the quote here uh, to summarize from Dr. Wolf. The essential amino acid to calorie ratio for high protein foods must also be considered when comparing protein rich foods. High quality proteins such as milk proteins enable essential amino acid requirements to be met with less caloric intake compared to lower quality proteins. So again, this is gonna have significant implications for the general population who already are looking for ways to reduce calories in their diet while then, you know, juxtaposition to um, likely wanting to or needing to increase protein intakes to get some of those benefits that we reported in previous slides. Now, here's another way to look at the similar concept. So if you recall, there are some experts suggesting for aiming somewhere between two and a half to three grams of leucine per meal to help maximize muscle protein synthesis. So what this table does is look at, you know, whey protein isolate in comparison to soy protein isolate, and then a, a number of different animal and plant-based foods, and you know the amount that would be need to consume to get 2.5 grams of leucine. And it looked at in terms of, as you can see, the calories to get 2.5 grams of leucine, you know, at the lowest amount, whey protein, 100 calories, and just goes up significantly from there when you go from uh, to soy protein isolate, to then whole foods, chicken, canned tuna, et cetera, down to some of these plant-based uh, portions, which again are, are just not efficient with which they deliver leucine in this case, and a number of more calories are coming with that. And again, you could see, you know, total protein is getting much higher as you go to lower quality proteins in order to get uh, that amount of leucine. So again, we're in the big picture, we're talking about the efficiency with which dairy proteins optimally deliver these essential amino acids and leucine in a highly digestible, highly bioavailable form that's gonna maximize and support muscle health. So in terms of my key takeaways uh, for this webinar, again, dairy proteins are the highest quality proteins available. And that's been shown most recently with this newly recommended way uh, to assess protein quality from that expert panel convened by the FAO, the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. And that could be due to any, any one of and or combination of the three different components that influence protein quality, right? That's a superior amino acid composition, having the full array of essential amino acids in the uh, optimal amounts to support uh, the body's needs, 
also may have higher digestibility and or bioavailability of those essential amino acids due to less um, anti-nutritional factors that can limit those things which are higher in different plant foods. Now, when you think of the real world implications of protein quality, uh, it looks at the ability of a protein to support muscle protein synthesis and how that then translates to muscle health. Now, some may have traditionally thought of this primarily in the sports nutrition uh, world, but actually, hopefully you've learned through um, the information I've taken you through today, that, that actually has broad implications across the lifespan and I've highlighted examples both with weight management and healthy aging. The available data supports that dairy proteins and primarily whey protein from the literature that's been published are superior to plant proteins in stimulating muscle protein synthesis. And differences in protein quality, while they can be accounted for by consuming a greater amount of lower quality protein, we need to think of the unintended consequences of making such a general blanket recommendation. I did highlight the implications in terms of consuming additional calories um, and how that could impact you know, weight management. What I didn't really uh, have time to indicate, but I do wanna mention here and seed it for further discussion, is that this also has implications in the need to produce more plant proteins in order to provide more total protein uh, that would need to be consumed to match this protein quality or actually match the health benefits um, from consuming more lower quality proteins. And you know, what does that mean from a sustainability perspective? We know that sustainability is growing in importance, not only with consumers, scientists, and actually policy ma uh, makers when you're looking at global implications of you know, our food system. Um, so when you're looking at different proteins, you need to think about it from a sustainability perspective not only simply on uh, the weight of the protein and how that might impact environmental considerations, but can that be corrected for protein quality? And there is research that's been published to show that when you know, different environmental impacts such as greenhouse gas are expressed based on the quality of that protein, it really diminishes that difference um, in environmental impact when you're looking at plant proteins in comparison to dairy protein. Thank you for your time, uh, and I look forward to addressing any questions you may have. This is Mary Wilcox, and I'm the owner of Significant Outcomes LLC. The, I work with clients side by side to help them identify opportunities in the food industry. And more specifically, I have spent the majority of my career working in protein. So the purpose of my talk today is to bring you some information about the protein landscape. As you know, in the media these days, everywhere you look, there's a headline about a new source of protein, a new company delivering proteins, and it starts to, the field is starting to get a little more crowded, which is fine, but it also can be confusing and you may not know where to go. So that's the point of my presentation today, is to help you identify what are those protein sources that are out there, but also how, how do they compare? What do they look like? And then also to let you know what uh, U.S. dairy protein and their role is in this landscape as well. So let's dig in. As I said, in my career, uh, the ingredient options have changed. When I first started my career over 25 years ago, we had our choice of soy, hydrolyzed collagen, and whey protein, but whey protein was still relatively new on the market at the time. And now today we have more options than ever before and there are more that are continuing to emerge. So let's go through what those look like. But before we do that, as formulators and uh, business managers and sourcing agents, I know that you are in charge of delivering formulations that are successful to meet the everyday challenges of consumers. But in order to do that, it's very complicated. And this hexagon represents the, the key areas of information that are required when you're making those decisions about what your final concept is going to look like. So as you can see here, uh, we have nutrition, processing, functionality, usage, supply, and sustainability. But for today's focus, we're going to not cover nutrition. There's been a lot of clinical nutrition science around protein and high quality protein diets and the impact that they have and why they're vital 
for life, but there's such a depth of information there, we'll handle that in a separate presentation. But for my talk today, let's start with processing. So processing can vary by the source material. As you look here, you'll see that we have flowers, concentrates, and isolates. And of these three sources, if you look at the chart, if you go from left to right, you can see that flowers generally require fewer steps. Concentrates require a few more steps, and they tend to be concentrated to higher levels of protein, around 80%, give or take, depends upon the source. Isolates, on the other hand, tend to be over 80%, and many of them over 90%. So as you can imagine, there are additional steps required to further concentrate and purify the isolates. So just remember, in general, as you increase in protein, there is more processing required. The other thing I wanna talk about is the dairy cow. She's actually very uniquely designed. The cow itself has a four-chambered stomach. And of her four-chambered stomach, the rumen in particular is pretty unique. She can consume things that are insoluble and also undigestible by humans. 80% of what she eats is material that we as human beings can't even digest. So she can take in those insoluble and undigestible materials. And in the rumen, the microorganisms that exist there help to digest that food into precursors for protein. Those precursors are then reassembled in the cow and excreted out the mammary system as this water-soluble, highly nutritious matrix called milk. That milk can then be turned into nutrient-rich foods and beverages that we can enjoy. And then the in, um, undigestible components are excreted and can be used as fertilizer on cropland to help replenish the soil that growing the crops and the plants may have depleted. But the key thing here, other than the fact that she is very unique in what she does as this uh, converter of inedible materials into nutritious materials, is she turns insoluble into water soluble. So keep that in mind as we continue this, to discuss processing. So for about 30 years now, the dairy industry has been researching ideas of ways to physically separate milk into its components. So separating the protein from the fat and, and the different uh, nutritional components within milk. As a part of that, one of the technologies that has proliferated the industry is a physical separation that uses membrane filtration and water. So think of it as the same or similar type of system as you would have for a water filtration system at home. But in this case, they use that to filter out the protein or fat and carbohydrates into different fractions. The nice thing about this is it's physical, it's gentle, it also helps maintain the co-products that come off. So in the case of milk and whey, the co-product that comes off is called permeate, pictured here. And that permeate can then be isolated and turned into other higher value applications for food usage. So protein processing, as I said, can start from the raw materials or it can start from co-products. So on this slide, you'll notice that this is from the raw material. And this is a study that was just um, conducted last year, comparing what the pro protein processing schematics might be of different materials. So on the left, you have milk protein. And as you can see, we separate the cream and then filter, concentrate, and dry. When you compare that to pea protein, rice, wheat, or chickpea, you can see that there's different steps depending upon what you start with. They may have to grind or dehull or split or extract or enzyme or wash or decant. There's different types of purification processes involved. I would say just in general, and if you look at the ones with the red boxes in particular, those steps tend to use solvents, salts, acids, and bases. So there is some kind of a conversion in order to solubilize the protein. On this slide, this is where we're starting from the co-products. So whey proteins, as an example, is a co-product of the cheese making industry. And so that's why we're starting with whey. But once again, we have the separation, filtration, concentrating, and drying. If you look at soy, almond, potato, and canola, you'll also see there's some additional steps once again to precipitate, neutralize, extract, 
and pre-prepare the products to solubilize those proteins. I would say just in general, a general rule of thumb, the more steps there is to any process, the greater the opportunity there is for the native protein structure to change or be altered based upon the process. So what might those processing conditions be? Well, it could be temperature, pH, pressure, solutes, or mixing. And I'll explain a little bit more. But the key here is not the, the conditions themselves. It's the fact that when they become extreme, that's when your protein becomes at risk of changing its structure and ultimately its solubility and functionality, which we'll talk about later. So temperature, denaturation. Denaturation is just the impact of temperature, which it could be heating, cooling, or freezing, causing the proteins to unfold. That unfolding can change how the proteins are structured and function. But if you go too far, you can actually break or change the proteins in an irreversible way. An example of this is think about your morning breakfast. You have a fresh egg that you crack open. It's a liquid. When you put it in a frying pan with heat, what happens? The protein denatures and changes. The protein then becomes a solid that cannot go back to being a liquid. So that's just a visual example of what that might include. But as I said, denaturation can happen multiple ways. As far as pH, that's based upon the acidity and alkalinity of the protein. Proteins have an isoelectric point, and that point is when the neutral or the charge on the protein becomes neutral. When that happens, the proteins are more susceptible to precipitation. So acidity is a very important thing and alkalinity when you're thinking about how you process and how long you subject your proteins to different pHs. Pressure is another one. Solutes is a common one. So as I was saying earlier about um, the need for solubilization of protein in order to extract it, salt is a common way that many plant-based sources do that. So as they're adding the salt and solub solubilizing the protein, if there's too extreme, like there's too much, basically it can backfire and the proteins can precipitate in a way that is not desired from a process perspective. So keeping careful control of salt and sugar, both during processing and in finished product is important to consider. Last but not least is shear. Shear is basically anything that causes the protein to break during mixing. It could be anywhere in your process. So it's important to engineer your processes with this in mind so that you can treat your proteins as gently as possible. So form impacting performance. As I just said, process then impacts the performance, and it does that through two different ways. There's functional properties and there's sensory properties. The functional properties are how ingredients behave, so how they work in your fin finished product from the time that you produce it and cook it and prepare it until the time you eat it. So depending upon your protein, it may function differently in different applications, which we'll discuss in a little while. Sensory evaluation is basically focused on sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Once again, your process can also impact those characteristics, and we will discuss those in more detail. So functional properties. These are the general functional properties that occur in common uh, food and beverage applications. So as you can see here, we have things that we're concerned about depending upon the application. For instance, we may need foaming. We may need water holding capacity. We may need emulsification, say in a super gravy. It just depends upon the application. So we'll go through a benchmarking study that took place to help you understand how these functionalities exist and what they mean as you're thinking about your proteins of choice for your formulations. So this benchmarking study specifically looked at water holding capacity, viscosity, heat stability, emulsion activity and stability, and foam activity and stability. So water holding capacity, I won't go into great detail on our methodologies, but I included them here for your information in case you decide you want to utilize some of them in your benchmarking that you do in-house. But specifically water holding capacity is 
really an indication of how well that protein is soluble and can hang on to the water in your finished product. Um, you'll also see on these slides as we go through them, off to the right, there's a protein legend. That legend dictates, if you look at the bottom of each protein source that was tested in the study, it has an abbreviation. So you can refer to that to understand which one is which. Uh, but that will be consistent throughout the slides that I'll be sharing. So here, when it comes to water holding capacity, you can see that milk, soy, and pea were greater than whey, potato, or rice. You can also see viscosity when it comes to water holding capacity, another common measurement that's taken. As far as viscosity goes, uh, this was measured with a viscosimeter, and the methodology is here for your information. And in this case, they used a 10% solution at room temperature for each protein source. As you can see, the milk and pea protein had higher viscosities than the whey, soy, potato, and rice. So with this in mind, with the water holding and viscosity, depending upon your application, you may choose certain proteins or not based upon the target of your final formulation. So if you're looking for something that is thicker or has a certain mouthfeel, or you, or you need that water holding capacity to improve the, the structure or the texture of your product, you may choose a milk protein or a pea protein versus a whey in this situation. Heat stability. So this specifically is measuring how stable the proteins remain after heating at different pHs. And specifically, it's measuring the sediment or the protein falling out of solution. So the larger the value in this case, the lower the heat stability. So it's desired to have a low value for better performance. So this slide shows heat stability at pH three. So pH three would be a typical pH of a high acid, low pH, hot fill type uh, process or finished products for a beverage as an example. So as you can see here, whey protein actually performed better than the plant proteins and milk protein. And whey protein, and especially whey protein isolate, is well known for the fact that it performs well in these low pH conditions. And unlike some of the other proteins, it does provide clarity. So you can actually have a clear beverage or a frozen item where you could have opacity and, and change the appearance. Heat stability at pH 7, however, differ. When you look at 7, which is more of a neutral pH, you see milk and whey protein performing better than the plant proteins. So if you're looking at more of an aseptic product um, from a beverage perspective, you might want to consider a milk or a whey protein versus one of the plant sources because of the stability. It depends upon the process of your finished product and how it will um, what it will go through before it reaches the consumers. Emulsion activity and stability is another thing. So emulsions are basically when you have small droplets of liquids that combine together in a homogeneous way. It's very, very important to soups and sauces and gravies. And, and basically it's, it's that idea of having an oil and a protein that exist together in a smooth, uh, sauce so that you don't detect separation. So the actual tests here, you'll notice um, their centrifuge to see if there's separation. And there was two ways that they measured it. One was they did it separate. And then secondly, what happened after heating and cooling. So the emulsion activity specifically here showed that milk and whey proteins, pea and soy, outperformed the potato and rice. However, after heating and cooling, you'll notice that the milk proteins and the whey protein concentrates outperformed the pea, soy, uh, potato, and isolate. So if you were looking for something, like I said, specifically in a soup or a sauce, where you need that emulsion to hold together to maintain the visual appearance and the mouthfeel that you're looking for in your finished product, you may wanna look at some of these proteins specifically for those types of applications. Foaming ability and foam stability. Many times in confections and baked goods, you need foam to help form the structure of your finished product. Uh, these abilities were tested via Vitamix 2 blender, 
And basically, first it was the initial foam ability, and then they waited 30 minutes to determine how stable that foam was. Did it maintain itself? So when it came to foam ability, here we see whey proteins um, were better than the soy and potato, milk, pea, and rice. So if you're looking for a foam, foaming protein, you may want to consider whey proteins in a baked good, for example. And stability-wise, you can see here as well, whey and then milk formed more stable foams than the plant-based proteins. So once again, depending upon the complexity of your application, you may want to consider their use. So sensor, this was the other part of consumer acceptance. Proteins were rehydrated and then a trained panel tasted them. They were in duplicate and they tried them in 12 sessions to analyze the data. As you can see by this spidergram here, it shows the different um, intensities of the aromas. So for instance, if you look at bitter, the longer peak there is rice. When you see milky cooked, that's the milk protein. So those just give you some examples of how to read this. But the real key thing to remember is that there are flavor differences between plant and dairy proteins. As you can see here, on each side, there are some very unique flavors for each group, but there are some shared flavors between the two groups. I would say just a general rule of thumb, as you increase the protein level of your protein sources, they tend to need, you'll tend to need higher levels of flavor in order to de detect it in your applications. Also, depending upon the source that you're using, you may want to choose savory versus sweet or different levels of flavor in order to achieve your final uh, product targets. This is also another reason why in some applications, plant proteins do require the use of uh, masking agents as, in addition to flavor to um, hide some of the more plant specific uh, flavor profiles that come through. So appearance, uh, we wanna look at appearance depending upon your application at different pHs as I mentioned before. So this was more of an aseptically processed product at 5% protein and specifically at neutral pH. And as you can see, there are some color and opacity differences. So depending on your final target of what you wanna create, you may choose different proteins accordingly. When you go to pH three, which is the higher acid, hot fill type conditions, which you'll see here, these beverages were heated to 82 C for two minutes. Uh, they do perform differently. Uh, the rice separated out right after processing and the pea was actually after overnight. I will say that it's very important to think about your final process of your final application when choosing your proteins. It's also important to screen proteins from different sources. Even when within types of protein, different sources because of those processing condition, conditions I mentioned before may perform differently. And so you need to assess that before you take it to your application. The proteins are also evaluated in bars. And this was a common bar where they made a 30% protein, 30% fat, 40% carbohydrate bar. They also put it into extended shelf life, accelerated shelf life to determine what would happen with bar hardness. As you can see, the uh, dairy-based proteins tended to be lighter in color. And then specifically the whey protein performed the best when it came to hardness. The plant-based were mixed. So for example, rice at the bottom that turned dark, it, it did not hurt and it, it did well in hardness score, but it definitely turned dark. So a lot of times formulators will use blends of proteins in order to achieve just the right texture and chewability of their bars. So usage and versatility. So as I've been sharing here, all proteins are not equal and selection really does matter. So here's some applications that I wanted to give you as examples. Um, just to show you the breadth of what protein can deliver. As you can see here, proteins can be used in many applications across day part. And they can also be in different styles. So for instance, on the bottom left corner, we have the lentil power soup. The lentil soup has 20 grams of protein and it combines the 
the benefits of both the plant-based and the dairy-based protein sources into one product. Specifically on the dairy side, it uses uh, micellar casein and MPC because they provide a lot of heat stability for the thermal processing that a soup will go through. They also use permeate to help prevent um, high levels of sodium by permeate itself being a flavor enhancement. Um, but you can also see like the wellness wafer. It only has five grams of protein. It could easily be considered a snack and, um, and used in that perspective to get in some extra protein. Um, this one specifically though uses uh, the whey crisps and the crisps were put in there to give it that extra little bit of crunchy texture to the formulation. But it also used the protein to bind it together um, to form the actual wafer. As you can see with the flatbreads and the bites, you also have the opportunity to incorporate uh, many ingredients, both proteins, permeates, and even yogurt and cheese to add different flavor dimensions, as well as to give you the textural properties that you're looking for in your final application. Same thing with the biscotti. You know, it, it's very important to get the right texture depending upon your baked good. And in that case, it uses um, the skim milk powder in addition to the protein to provide that texture. So supply security. We definitely need ample, consistent, safe supply. Who wants to launch a new product and then suffer sh shortages or recalls or issues that will disappoint your customers? So it's very important to consider. So this slide shows an example from 2016 of the different amounts of different protein sources globally. As you can see, soy and dairy are more mature and more well-established in, in, as an industry in their volumes as, as some of the other plant sources are still coming online. This is an important consideration because they are still limited in their total supply. And as they're scaling up new operations and facilities, they still have to uh, figure out all of the different processing in order to make sure you have consistent supply. So it's very important to benchmark your products and your ingredients through over time to ensure that you're getting the solubility and functionality and performance that you're looking for. Dedication to quality and safety. Here in the US, uh, the dairy industry is dedicated to testing from farm to fork, but this dedication also extends back to the farm. Farmers came together to come up with a voluntary and monitored approach to provide best in class animal care for their cows. And it has been ISO approved for international audiences. So this basically helps the farmers know the best practices and be audited to make sure they're following the best practices in cow care. So sustainability, we all know a lot of people are interested in this area. Um, the dairy proteins actually have had life cycle assessments since 2012 and have continued to look at new technologies to make improvements so that they can continue to lower their, their impact. So let me give you some examples. Since 1950, we as an industry in the dairy industry, milk fewer cows but make more milk. So the use of technology and genetics and feeding programs have helped improve this efficiency, which has also helped lower the carbon footprint. U.S. dairy farmers have also used technologies to change how they use their resources. So between 2007 and 2017, you can see here, they've used 30% less water, 21% less land for the same gallon of milk, and they've produced 19% less greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, when you look at the total greenhouse gas emissions for U.S. dairy, it accounts for 2% of the global greenhouse gas emissions versus, say, transportation, that's over 28%. So they continue to work and improve in this area. They also are looking at water, and because they use a water filtration system and the fact that milk is 87% water, uh, dairy proteins in particular have the ability to use water, reuse water at every step of the way, whether it be in process, as each co-stream is taken off, water can be 
filtered out and purified and then be used to clean facilities, equipment, run the boilers, used in the landscaping and so forth. And the same thing on farm, water there can also be recycled. So it really helps when it comes to efficiency and yield. The US dairy farmers and processors also have an ongoing commitment to sustainability and they have said they will report a meaningful progress every five years. So we know consumers are demanding a lot and you as formulators and, and business managers have a lot to perform to meet their demands. They're looking for complete nutrition for their diets and their health and wellness. They want visual appeal because they want to know that it's high quality and it's a premium product. They want to explore global taste profiles and experience new textures to delight their taste buds. They're also very interested in easy to understand clean labels for ingredients. They want to know that the ingredients are sustainably produced so that for the planet, and last but not least, they want consistent and safe supply that they know and they can trust to feed their families. So all of these different elements is a lot to deliver, but I hope you can see based upon what I've shared today that U.S. dairy ingredients do have the ability to deliver convenient solutions to meet these demands. So just so you know, and we go back to the hexagon, there's lots of information that you may need as you're making your formulation decisions. So please feel free to visit thinkusadairy.org and their staff members for additional information. There's a lot of concepts and prototypes there for you to look at. There's technical information on functionality and understanding how an ingredient might function in your application. And they also have a database there to help you locate a U.S. dairy ingredient supplier that may have the type of ingredient you're looking for for your specific application. So with that, I will say thank you for your time and attention. As I said, I, I own Significant Outcomes LLC listed here as a portfolio of my services. If I could ever be of assistance, please reach out. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you, Matt and Mary, for sharing your valuable insights. Today's nutrition and functionality overview of dairy and plant proteins showcases the truly unique package provided by U.S. dairy proteins. They offer strong functionality advantages to food and beverage processors, as well as unmatched nutrition benefits across all life stages. All proteins are not created equal, and no other type of protein ingredient offers the range of specific and quantifiable benefits provided by highly functional, nutritious, minimally processed, mild flavored U.S. dairy proteins. As mentioned earlier, we're also very proud of our sustainability story, which is a cycle that starts with the U.S. dairy farmers' commitment to unparalleled care and management of their cows to reduce the carbon footprint. The United States is one of the largest milk producers in the world with the average U.S. cow producing four times more milk than the average global cow. This greater per cow productivity results in the US having the smallest greenhouse gas emissions per unit of milk produced compared to other regions in the world. In closing, I'd like to mention a US DEC resource entitled A New Era for Protein, Why US Dairy Delivers in the Crowded Protein Marketplace. This free report can be found at thinkusadairy.org and it details a comparison of protein ingredients from different sources based on their functionality and sensory attributes. U.S. DEC and the U.S. dairy industry are your innovation partners, and our offices around the world are ready to assist you in a variety of ways, such as providing formulation and application ideas, technical support, and identifying dairy ingredient suppliers to meet your specific needs. Thank you very much for participating in our webinar today. We hope you found it useful. Estamos aqui de volta, gente, depois das apresentações. É, queria agradecer aos nossos três palestrantes aqui hoje sobre as informações tão valiosas. 
e dizer para vocês que a gente recebeu diversas perguntas ao longo da apresentação e a gente vai começar uma sessão bem interativa de perguntas e respostas, mas eu continuo incentivando vocês a continuarem enviando suas perguntas tanto pelo chat do, do evento, quanto pela funcionalidade de perguntas e respostas, ok? Antes da gente proceder para a sessão, é, eu quero falar algumas coisas. É, primeiro, a gente está gravando esse evento, a gente vai disponibilizar essa gravação a todos os participantes depois, então a gente vai mandar um link para vocês por e-mail, tá? Assim como a gente também vai fornecer um certificado de participação que também vai ser depois emitido é, por e-mail, tá? Então, fiquem de olho nos e-mails de vocês e fiquem em contato conosco, tá? Bom, pessoal, é, vamos começar aqui com algumas perguntas. É, a primeira, eu quero convidar aqui os nossos panelistas, por favor, para abrir as câmeras, estarem já... É, é, aptos né, a responder as, as, as perguntas. Vamos lá. A primeira pergunta que eu tenho, ele, ela vem do Marcelo, e ela é um pouquinho técnica, e acredito que tanto a Mary quanto a Terry poderiam contribuir aqui com essa resposta. A pergunta do Marcelo é a seguinte, pessoal. Como diminuir a formação de espuma no processo de dissolução em água de WPI? Mary, você poderia me ajudar com essa resposta? Sure, sure I would be happy to. Uh, foaming is a, a very important thing to control when you're dealing with proteins, whether it be whey or milk, but it tends to be a bigger concern with whey-based proteins. Um, so it's important to think about your whole process. So you need to, first of all, you need to make sure you have good water quality because the water quality, the mineral content can impact your proteins and how they uh, go into solution, but also how they perform once they're in solution, which may cause you other issues later in your process when you're pH adjusting and heat treating. So it's important to always check your water source and that's something that's often overlooked. Uh, then when you get to the actual hydration uh, or mixing part of it, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, obviously whey proteins, we, tend to have people mix them in about half of the water at a little higher rate and then slow down because you want to minimize the agitation. That's what's helping to create the foam. But obviously you need to get your mix started. So um, you can do it for a little bit at a higher speed and then slow down to a lower speed to give it that time of hydration. Uh, whey proteins in particular need about 20 to 30 minutes to fully hydrate. And milk proteins actually take longer and tend to need a higher temperature water uh, for mixing. So, um, you know, making sure that it's gentle and not too fast. Um, some people do put in some additional recirculation and um, mixing apparatuses, and that's fine too, because uh, it depends on if you have a batch or a continuous system. But the other key concern there is think about your recirculation, make sure it is uh, properly insulated so you're maintaining a constant state uh, for your mix. But also anytime you can limit the number of turns or the length of that recirculation, that will also min minimize the amount of agitation in total as you're hydrating your proteins. Um, also pre-blending your ingredients together can also help minimize that foaming um, situation. And of course, there are um, commercial food grade uh, defomers that people use as well. Muito interessante. Terry, você quer adicionar alguma coisa? Uh, I think Mary covered that pretty completely, but I will say that, you know, she, she mentioned defomers there at the end. And sometimes, even if you do all of those things that Mary suggested, you're still going to have some foam and um, food grade defomers such as silicon based defomers are, are pretty widely used and widely accepted. And because of the low use rate, um, they're considered processing aids and don't need to be, you know, included on your ingredient label. So they're a, a very good and common solution as well. Muito obrigada. E, Mar é, 
na verdade, eu também gostaria de dizer que ano passado a gente teve um webinar muito interessante sobre aplicação também de proteínas com algumas demonstrações em laboratório. Vamos continuar em contato, a gente pode mandar o link desse webinar e a gente comenta um pouco exatamente sobre o foaming lá, tá bom? É, depois o nosso escritório fala diretamente com você, tá bom? É... Marcelo, muito obrigada. Gente, tem uma outra pergunta aqui, bem interessante, aliás, do Matheus, e essa pergunta é para o Matt. Um, o Matheus, na verdade, ele, ele tem aqui um pensamento, então eu vou ler exatamente o que ele escreveu, e aí a gente só tem que acompanhar aqui, vamos lá. Matheus diz, se o ideal é ingerir 2,5 gramas de leucina por dia... E para isto, considerando WPI, preciso consumir um scoop de aproximadamente 33 gramas, mas se o indicado mínimo é de 0,8 gramas de proteína por quilo, no meu caso, seria 64 gramas de proteína por dia, recomendação de consumo. É, neste caso, então, e, o Matheus diz, eu estaria ingerindo mais leucina do que eu preciso. Então, levando isso em consideração, seria melhor consumir proteína vegetal, pois estaria consumindo 64 gramas e desperdiçando menos leucina. Esse raciocínio, Matt, ele está correto? Ele não está observando aqui o ganho calórico. Ah, então, na verdade, a pergunta que ele amarra aqui é como é feito o equilíbrio entre o intake de proteína geral versus o intake de leucina? Uh, Matt, é bem técnico, espero que vocês tenham entendido. Vamos lá. Sure, yes, thank you. Um, very clear, so appreciate the question. And, you know, thinking through the practical application of some of these concepts um, that I discussed here today, so that's great. Um, one uh, point, though, that um, kind of impacts the framing of the question is that the leucine recommendations that you um, referred to, which I talked about in my presentation, the say the goal or recommendation from uh, different health uh, authorities around, you know, 2.5 to 3 grams of leucine, those recommendations were per meal, not per day. So if we were to go at the high end of that range, 3 grams of leucine per meal, you know, that would be around nine grams of leucine per day. So in, in that instance, um, it would, you know, significantly change the framing of your question. So, um, you know, there wouldn't be this disparity that you were thinking regarding trying to hit targets for total leucine, as well as how that would impact uh, total protein intake. So it would be much more in a, in a range in where you're not going to you know, significantly exceed total protein intake ranges to try to hit those three grams of leucine per meal. Um, the other point I just want to mention um, from a, a concept standpoint is your reference to the RDA um, as that kind of protein intake goal. And you may recall on one of my slides, I talked about the RDA And I also talked about the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. And, um, you know, it's important to look at both of these recommendations when trying to um, prescribe or have a target for protein intake for an individual or even a population. You know, that, that RDA is established as the minimum protein intake to prevent deficiency. Again, it's not meant to be as a ceiling. So depending on some of these calculations and how you may be working through them, again, the RDA does not need to be looked upon as a ceiling by which, you know, consuming additional protein above the RDA is either not going to have a benefit or be negative when it comes to health. Actually, that's a fairly low and conservative solely established to prevent deficiency. You may recall On that slide, I showed the RDA in comparison to the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, say, again, for a 70 kilogram uh, weighing individual and a 2,000 calorie diet. And the RDA was about 56 grams, if I'm remembering correctly. 
uh, of protein per day, while the AMDR ranged, you know, much broader, right? 50 grams to 175 grams. So you have that very large window to play in. And again, the, you know, the particular target would be impacted by a number of individual factors in terms of the per per person's total diet, their calorie goals, um, their health, uh, body composition and goals, et cetera, could all play a role there. Ok, muito obrigada. Matheus, eu espero que tenha ficado claro para você e qualquer coisa a gente também pode continuar conversando à parte, tá? É, vamos lá, a gente tem uma pergunta também que a gente recebeu é, da Andrea durante o começo da apresentação do Matt. Matt, você poderia dizer para a Andrea que tipo de proteína de soja você usou é, naquela comparação que você apresentou nos seus slides? Yes, thank you, uh, Andrea, um, and thank you for sending that question in, because as um, the slides were going in the presentation, I was able to check my files to look back specifically uh, from that paper by Volek and colleagues um, for that particular study. So it was a whey protein concentrate uh, in comparison to a soy protein isolate um, in that particular study. The other thing I will just mention in that regard is that um, those two supplements were matched for total protein content. They weren't matched on weight. So in the big picture, you know, whether they're isolates or concentrates, it really shouldn't um, matter much because, you know, total weights were able to be adjusted to provide the matched protein content and actually they matched calorie content as well. And, and those, those were verified by five different um, samples that were tested at an independent laboratory. So um, again, if you're, if you're interested, um, I do believe these slides will be available, the slides in the recording for all attendees and all of the uh, studies I referenced, the, the, the reference is on that slide. So you could, you could look at those papers or if you have a, a challenge in getting them, um, Carolina can connect us so that um, I could provide full text papers for any of the things that I presented if you're interested in reading more detail of those studies. Perfeito. Obrigada, Matt. É, e só realmente adicionando, é, a gente pode colocar vocês em contato e fornecer as informações adicionais, tá, Andrea? Obrigada pela pergunta. Vamos lá, a gente recebeu agora uma pergunta do Robson. E eu achei bem curiosa, eu vou pedir para a Mary me ajudar a responder essa, mas eu também queria comentar alguma coisa. Bom, o Robson diz, Olá, meu nome é Robson e eu trabalho com lácteos e derivados de carne no sul do Brasil. Eu percebi que enfrentamos problemas em relação à qualidade da proteína do soro de leite por aqui, é, já que a maioria dos produtos disponíveis são misturados com outro tipo de proteína, mas essa informação ela não é clara. É, existe ou vocês veem alguma solução para esse problema? Mary? That's a great question. And it, and it kind of goes back to even the broader question of different sources of protein. Because there can be differences even between one, you know, soy protein to the next or whey protein to the next, depending upon how it's manufactured. So it's a very important to develop relationships with your suppliers and ask them about their sources. Is it locally sourced? Do they import the materials? Are they uh, blending materials? You know, what is that? What, what are they starting with and how are they handling and processing the material that's getting to you? Obviously you can put in place uh, specifications, but that doesn't you know, necessarily mean that you always will receive the same product. So it's important to benchmark your products over time. So depending upon the type of product, you know, whether it's a wine, water binding or viscosity or browning or whatever functionality you're looking for in your ingredient to work in your formulation, you should put together um, a routine test for your supplier on those attributes to make sure it's it's staying consistent. It's especially important when you're dealing with some of the, the newer sources um, as they come online because they may continue to scale their process to 
uh, make their products more functional, which is great. But if they make that change and you're not prepared for that change, it might impact your formulation. So it's always a good practice to do and have those relationships and develop those relationships. Because in the end, you and your your supplier work hand in hand and you wanna make sure you have that consistent safe supply. You wanna make sure that um, if you have a special need and let's say you do need some extra hydration properties um, to your product, many times if you have a good relationship with the supplier, they may have some different variations of products that can help you address that need to save you time and um, energy and efficiency during your process. Um, an example might be if it's an acidified beverage, possibly providing a pre-acidified protein. So the amount of acid that you need to add on your end may be less in the total process. So it just really depends upon your application, but developing that relationship helps you. It helps your supplier know what you need and identify the gaps. And it also helps your customers because in the end, they have a wonderfully safe and tasty product to consume. So I hope that answers the question. Sim, responde. E eu só quero, na verdade, agregar um pouco mais de informação e emendar uma resposta à pergunta da Mariângela, é, nessa pergunta do, do Robson. Mas a Mariângela nos pergunta, assim, como contatar os fornecedores de proteínas dos Estados Unidos? E, e é exatamente é, o que eu quero dizer, que o nosso trabalho aqui como escritório do USDEC na América do Sul é facilitar o contato com tais fornecedores, e exatamente o que a Mary falou, é, é muito importante criar esses relacionamentos com o fornecedor, fazer sempre os testes né, nos produtos, e sempre ter os Estados Unidos também em mente com uma origem confiável né, de proteínas, de produtos, de ingredientes no geral, tá? Então, acho que aqui a resposta adicional é sigam em contato com o nosso escritório, que a gente pode realmente colocá-los em contato com fornecedores confiáveis. E aí, a gente tem uma outra pergunta, que eu quero até chamar a Terry para comentar, é, porque teve, recebeu no registro falando, é, perguntando para a gente qual que é a diferença, então, é, dos produtos, das proteínas do leite dos Estados Unidos versus as de outras origens. Por que, então, que a gente deve falar com esses fornecedores? Terry, talvez você possa ajudar a gente a complementar todo esse pensamento aqui. Thanks, Caroline. I appreciate that question. Um, because, of course, the majority of what we were speaking about during this webinar was about comparing different types of protein sources. Um, but, of course, you know, comparing different suppliers of dairy proteins is really important as well. And we recognize that in the US, we are not your only choice. We have um, strong competition from all around the world, um, particularly from Europe and New Zealand, make great protein products as well. Um, but I would like to emphasize, um, you know, that the U.S. Uh, produces, you know, really high quality, year-round, safe, clean, uh, sustainably produced products. We're um, a big country, so we have a lot of different protein processors. Uh, so there's a, you know, a wide variety of processes and products uh, to choose from. Uh, so you, you have a lot of choices. Um, in addition, as I mentioned in the, um, in the presentation, the US uh, dairy industry has the smallest greenhouse gas footprint per unit of milk produced in the entire world. And this is compared to every other country in the world. And we take a lot of pride in that. Um, US Farmers as well as U.S. processors have worked very hard over the last, I would say, you know, 30 years at least, uh, to um, improve their processes, uh, both from a sustainability, uh, sustainability, animal care, as Mary talked about, and also just making clean, safe products. So, um, and plus we have River Global, who is a great resource uh, for us in South America. So we we feel that we 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 do bring a lot of advantages to the table. Um, if you have specific requirements, um, our, you know, the processors in the U.S. are willing to work with you to, you know, understand what your requirements are, and that may even include making, uh, let's say, a customized product if you have customized specs or functionality requirements. So, um, you know, we're we're open to working with you, having a, a you know, a, um, a complete, you know, relationship. Um, So, you know, any questions that you have, feel free to bring them to us, but we really strongly, you know, want to emphasize that we, um, you know, that we're a supplier that you can rely on and, um, you know, please reach out to us regarding your needs. 
I might also add on that, as Terry, as Terry mentioned, there are many customized products that are available here in the US. And it's important to, like I said, put your needs up front, but not just your needs, but also your process. Because depending upon your process, there may be ways you can use a customized ingredient that will save you money in the end with how you create your product. And, and not just the from a protein perspective, but uh, dairy proteins in particular can be highly functional. So they can actually help, you know, depending upon what you're putting together, you may even recoup some savings on, um, you know, stabilizers and um, hydrocolloids and or um, flavors. It just depends upon your finished product and what your needs are and how you how you how you do your process so that once again having those relationships having those conversations can not only save you headaches but can also potentially save you money so um you know don't don't forget to um think about your process and share more of that information with your suppliers there's one, one more one more point about that i mean to add to mary's point about saving money uh, by potentially being able to, you know, limit the use of other ingredients. In addition to saving money, you'll also end up having a cleaner label, a cleaner ingredient statement, um, which is something that a lot of your, um, you know, is very popular today and a lot of consumers are looking for. Muito verdade. É uma tendência grande de mercado. Obrigada. Terry e Mary pelas respostas. Acredito que tenha sido bem respondidas as perguntas da Maria Ângela e do Robson. E, aliás, falando em tendências de mercado, a gente tem uma outra pergunta que a gente recebeu na parte dos registros, e acredito que o Matt possa é, me ajudar a responder essa, mas vai exatamente na linha agora de sustentabilidade, alguma coisa que a, a Terry também comentou. Bom, a pergunta é, os consumidores estão cada vez mais atentos ao tema de sustentabilidade o impacto ambiental que passa a ser uma das considerações na hora de fazer suas escolhas alimentares. Vocês podem falar sobre o impacto ambiental dos lácteos em comparação com outras proteínas? Matt. Yeah, sure. Happy to uh, speak on that topic. Um, as I touched on very briefly, and then, you know, Terry and and Mary also touched on elements of sustainability. You know, it's certainly a very important topic um, and one in which the US dairy industry is committed to addressing uh, and striving for continuous improvement across the broad topic of sustainability. And there are a couple of points I want to mention um, in the framing of that discussion and that question. And really the first is, you know, when comparing environmental impact of dairy proteins and compared to other proteins, one critical point um, that you need to ensure is that you know, you're comparing um, similar types of data. In the US, we have a phrase, you know, comparing apples to apples, um, so to speak. Um, because as many of you are familiar with, there are multiple stages of a food or products life cycle, right? From growing the raw ingredient to processing that ingredient on farm to then sending it to a processor for potential additional processing and all the other steps that take that product or ingredient to uh, a consumer's table um, and, and be ready for consumption. Now there are elements or impacts um, on the environment across that entire life cycle of the product. And when we're looking at, again, you know, whether it's scientific papers or lay press articles that make statements regarding comparisons of one protein or food compared to the other, we really need to look at that source data to ensure that the stages of the life cycle from which that environmental impact measure, let's say greenhouse gas, for example, was derived, are the same when looking at one one food or one protein compared to the other. Because if that, if you cannot validate that information, then any of the conclusions made uh, from those two data points really are not valid because um, again, you know, there are, are, are a variety of methodologies and a variety of ways in which this is done. And you really need to be sure you're making those similar comparisons. Now, when talking about US dairy specifically, um, U.S. Dairy completed a full life cycle assessment. That means, you know, from the growing of the of milk uh, and dairy on the farm 
all the way to the consumer's table. Um, we did that for milk production in about 2007. And, and, and even today, it remains one of the most comprehensive and science-based life cycle assessments available conducted in any agricultural sector. And it's been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. So you know these are independently validated and credited data. What we learned was that you know, dairy contributes about 2% of total US greenhouse gas emissions, 5.1% of total water, and 3.7% of total farmland. Um, so, you know, I think this is very modest, and particularly when you factor that into the, the, the quality of the nutrition that is provided for that very modest environmental impact, because we know all food production has an environmental impact. Um, and this brings me to my last point that I want to make here when bridging and thinking about that cost, the environmental cost to benefit ratio, and in this case, nutritional benefit. Um, and something that I did touch on very briefly, but I'll speak to a bit more again in, in wrapping this question is that, you know, often you'll see different foods or let's say protein ingredients compared um, with their environmental impact. Again, we'll use greenhouse gas as the example, you know, you know based on a functional unit is the term used, you know, greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of product or per ton of product, right? So a mass, a weight um, measure. Um, now, when thinking about nutrition and thinking about you know, the broad benefit um, of that environmental cost, you know, the weight is, does not give a judge of the benefit, certainly not the nutritional benefit, right? So are there, there are ways in which to do that. One would simply be calories. You know, the greenhouse gas um, produced for calories provided. But another one, particularly when you're talking about protein ingredients, is looking at the protein quality. And there have been a few publications which has looked at comparisons with greenhouse gas production versus a, a quality of the protein produced. And when that is done, uh, and you look at you know, dairy compared to various plant sources, that, that disparity or difference um, that is evident when you're looking at greenhouse gas per weight of the food produced is significantly reduced or even in sometimes flipped where dairy proteins will, will have less greenhouse gas produced when normalized for the protein quality. So um, again, I think hopefully those give you some indicators to look for when thinking about environmental impact. But again, you know, either on our thinkusdairy.org website or others can comment on impact. And I see Mary has a comment that she'd like to add. Yes, and just to follow on to what you were saying, Matt, I, I think people uh, don't, well, I know a lot of people don't understand where their food comes from. And, you know, the charts that I showed you, the plant protein today, because of the steps that are involved to extract it <clears throat> and solubilize it, I mean, it's not sustainable. Those co-product streams that are coming off are consumed by animals, they're consumed by cows. I mean, think of soybeans, a lot of soybeans are consumed by cows of those streams that come off at the beginning. So, you know, when you, when you think about sustainability, you know, you have to think about everything in its whole. And um, it's, I will say one thing about the dairy industry, when I started my career, um, they did not know what to do with their co-product streams. Um, and that was right when we started doing research in animals to see what benefit it might have in animals. And here we are all these years later, and we hear Matt talk about how highly nutritious whey protein is and, and how it functions in the body. And so, you know, that took, you know, 20, 30 years to, of evolution to get that processing down so that the dairy industry could use all of those co-product streams. So for instance, the permeate that I talked about before, is a, is a great high you know, value added ingredient that can be used in certain formulations to reduce added sodium or to enhance the flavor of a savory product. So um, it's important to realize that when you think about the whole picture. So um, I, just, I just wanted to clarify that because I don't think we always think about, we always think about the end product, not where it comes from and, and how it gets to there and that there's side streams that come off. I can just um, just add a little bit more to that. So as, as Mary mentioned, the you know the cows eat 
what cows eat is, is foods that humans can't, right? And so that's putting products that would otherwise go to waste, putting them to use. Cows also graze on land that can't always efficiently be used to grow crops. Um, so in a way, um, cows are very efficiently putting the land and all of these, what we think of as waste materials to use. Um, so it makes, it makes dairy really a, a super efficient, you know, protein source. Um, and when we think in terms of, um, you know, feeding the, the growing population of the world, we're going to need more food than what's being produced now. Uh, and dairy can really help contribute by being such an efficient source of protein. It's not going to take as much as many resources uh, to produce as much dairy as it would of some um, plant based crops to be able to feed people and, the, and to feed people well, not just to uh, feed people low quality proteins, but to feed people well. So that, that's really very important to keep that in mind. Muito obrigada a todos pela resposta bem completa. É, pessoal, a gente está chegando aqui ao final do evento, mas eu ainda tenho... Vamos fazer duas perguntas, porque são bem importantes. É, mas a primeira aqui que eu tenho... Só um minutinho, gente. Ah, é muita pergunta. Vamos lá. É, essa daqui é para o Matt. É, is, Matt, existem diferenças nos benefícios para a saúde de concentrados de proteína de soro de leite versus isolados versus hidrolisados, alguma delas é melhor para a saúde muscular? Yes, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I think a very common question, obviously, as we've we've kind of alluded to here, and many of you are aware, there are a number of different options when thinking about which dairy protein to select. I'll say generally speaking from a nutrition perspective, there is not much data that would um, drive that decision in terms of, you know, as I mentioned, muscle health here. Um, while we generally know, right, an isolate is a bit, is a bit more concentrated in terms of its protein percent uh, in relation to its overall weight in comparison to a concentrate, but um, so it might be a bit more efficient, again, on a weight perspective, of delivering the amount of protein and essential amino acid that might be needed for a certain population. Um, you know, there is not, you know, beyond that, there is really not much data at all to suggest an isolate would provide greater health benefit in comparison to a, to a concentrate. Now, one consideration with that from a nutrition or health perspective could be the lactose content. For certain populations that are, you know, lactose insensitive, and we know there is a wide variability in terms of the amount of lactose um, individuals who report lactose intolerance um, can tolerate or handle. Um, I believe whey protein concentrate is about 4% lactose uh, by weight, while whey protein isolate is maybe 0.5 to 1%. So in that respect, if your target consumer, um, you know that they have some concerns regarding lactose, that might be a reason to select an isolate over a concentrate. Um, the last point I'll mention there um, in terms of, of the different options are when thinking about hydrolysis. Now we know hydrolysis are partially digested um, forms of that whey protein. Um, and those are usually, you know, um, talked about in terms of, you know, a faster, faster, more available, you know, faster available um, essential amino acids into the blood and then into the tissues, right? And yes, that, that is true, um, you know, because they're partially digested, they will show up in your bloodstream quicker than if you're having the intact. But I will say, I am not aware of any data that would show that 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 subtle difference in this in the speed with which those amino acids are available in the blood have really any true uh, difference when it comes to uh, a true health outcome. So I think you know while there are some some information there, I think what more would need to be done to really show that that matters. I mean, just a whey protein concentrate is a very fast acting, fast digested quickly available protein source. So again, from a health perspective, I really think it comes down to lactose, but um, you know, as you know, Mary or Terry can speak to, you know, there might be, you know, there certainly are more 
considerations from an application side as why one might select, you know, one of those proteins uh, in comparison to the other? Yes, <clears throat> typically um, hydrolysis are used more for digestive or immune compromised individuals that maybe cannot you know, digest completely. So it just, it's, it's easier for them to absorb those nutrients. Um, the other area where hydrolysates are used a lot is specifically uh, in bar formulations where you're looking for shelf stability of your product over time. And so a blend of uh, whey protein hydrolysates with other, uh, you know, milk proteins or whey proteins helps give you the correct chew and texture that you're looking for to be maintained on the shelf. So it's, it, they're important to consider in bars and also, you know, just more snack or, or things where um, the shelf life may change over time. Muito obrigada. Pessoal, eu sei que eu falei que eram duas perguntas, mas a gente já está super avançada em tempo, então eu vou encerrar essa sessão de perguntas e respostas, mas antes que vocês saiam, que eu sei que já era do almoço, segurem um pouquinho, eu tenho uma última pergunta aqui para fazer para vocês sobre a avaliação do evento, que vai ajudar muito a gente a continuar criando os eventos para vocês. Então, agradeceria muito se vocês pudessem responder. E aí a gente encerra se vocês puderem dizer o que vocês acharam no evento de hoje. Enquanto vocês votam, eu queria dizer também que, bom, de novo, a gente vai disponibilizar a gravação do evento, o certificado de participação, e a gente também vai responder a todas as perguntas que não foram respondidas ao vivo por e-mail, tá? Então, por favor, não fiquem bravos com a gente, é que foi muito produtivo, a gente recebeu muitas perguntas, tá? E outra coisa que eu queria também é, comentar é que a gente está disponível aqui para continuar trabalhando com vocês, para responder futuras eventuais perguntas seja suportando vocês no desenvolvimento de formulações, seja fornecendo os materiais técnicos. Eu quero recomendar também a visita ao site do USDEC, que eu já vou colocar aqui na tela para vocês. Bom, encerrando aqui a, a pergunta, eu vou só compartilhar com vocês, porque a gente teve uma excelente avaliação. Muito obrigada de novo pelo carinho pela participação de todos. É, bom, encerrando. Vamos... Colocar aqui os e-mails agora dos nossos palestrantes para que vocês possam escrever diretamente para eles e também para o nosso escritório, tá? Então, aqui eu tenho o contato do Matt, tenho o contato da Mary, da Terry e do nosso escritório. A gente tem um escritório aqui em São Paulo, a gente cobre a América do Sul, tá? Então, por favor, escrevam para mim. Sou eu, a Clarice e toda a nossa equipe que vai estar respondendo todas as suas perguntas. E o site que eu quero recomendar para visitação é o www.fincoessaydairy.org. Ai, mas eu não fala inglês, não tenho segurança. Tem tradução para português, tá, gente? Então, qualquer dúvida, por favor, falem conosco. E agora, só para a gente realmente encerrar o evento, eu gostaria de convidar os nossos palestrantes para fazer os comentários finais e que a gente possa se despedir da nossa audiência. Terry, por favor. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope that it was obvious that we love talking about dairy proteins. Uh, we're very excited about this subject, and uh, we really, um, you know, we really enjoyed having this opportunity to help help you learn more. And um, hope that it was useful for you. So, thanks very much for attending. Muito obrigada, Matt. Yes. Um... Again, echoing Terry's comments, you know, thank you um, all for your time and interest today. Um, and certainly, you know, building upon things that were mentioned in our, our presentations, you know, not only trying to, you know, the benefits of developing relationships with your suppliers, but also developing relationships with, with our organization as well, US DEC and then River Global as a, you know, um, you know conduit to providing our information. You know, there is so much information to share. We did our best within the time allotted, but we can continue to help um, address individual questions and needs as you, you know, think about how you want to utilize dairy proteins in your formulations. Perfeito. Muito obrigada. Mary? And I hope that you heard uh, through some of my comments, uh, the innovation potential in the world of protein continues to be strong. 
there's so many uh, new and customized products out there. And that's why that relationship and conversation is important. But also that's where true innovation comes from. And as Matt shared, uh, individuals need high quality, nutritious dairy proteins in their diets. And there's so many creative ways to turn it into other forms. It could be bites, it could be gels, it could be frozen desserts, all kinds of different food products. So uh, the sky's the limit and you know, reach out to these resources. They're here, there's lots of um, application formulas, there's technical sheets, there's these webinars, there's so much information at your fingertips through US Tech and River Global. So um, please do not, do not uh, feel like you have to figure it out on your own, come to them and they can help get you to the right people to find those resources as you're either designing your process or formulating your new product. Perfeito, muito obrigada, Mary. Então, agora também eu me despeço de vocês, mais uma vez agradeço a participação de todos, tá? Eu lembro também que a gente tem aqui o nosso site, tem ali o link para preencher o formulário de avaliação depois, para também obter é, o acesso ao certificado e as gravações. De novo, muito obrigada, um prazer e tenha um excelente resto de dia. Até a próxima. Tchau, tchau.